Welcome to Access Television, where we shamelessly promote our friends and community. On this episode of Access TV, we're going to take a big look at the big picture of the downtown east side and the local area plan. And then we'll come around to hearing from Jean Swanson. She's going to draw it out from 1980 to 2014, the path that housing has taken here in Vancouver. And Wendy Peterson brings us three special guests from single resident occupancy rooms. They do a great job of explaining to us the quality of life and how community doesn't just come from place, but from the people around you. And we're going to honor the cultural aspect of community as well. We're going to explain what authentic Indigenous means and find out how to honor the artist. As well, we're going to check in with the Urban Grange project that Judy Kenzie is leading here in East Vancouver. I hope you're getting your fingers into the dirt. Spring waits for nobody. Let's hear now from Wendy Peterson. She's in conversation with Tamara Herman and Herb Varley. Hello, my name is Wendy Peterson. Welcome to Access TV, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. We have in the studio with us two people who were involved with the city's 30-year uh, plan for the downtown east side. Tamara Herman, uh, Herb Barley, welcome. So we're here to find out what that decision, um, what happened. And Tamara, it, uh, the decision, the city council made a, a plan for the downtown east side. Um, they voted on it on March 12th. So what happened? Was there anything good that came out of it for downtown east side residents? I think the good thing that came out of it is pretty intangible. Um, there were a group of people who, low-income people, residents of the downtown east side who worked together over two years to monitor what the city was doing, meet with the city, and push for good things for the low-income community. So I think the fact that that group was solidified as a force to be reckoned with in the downtown east side is was a good thing. There's something about the zoning too. Was there a yes. little good piece there? Yes. So the piece that we fought for and we won is a rule it's called the 60-40 zoning rule and basically what it means is that all new developments that go up in the downtown east side Oppenheimer district which is a small district within the downtown east side 60% of any new housing has to be social housing and 40% has to be market rentals so basically it means no condos in a block in the downtown east side Okay, so, but there's a little catch to it, Herb. Mm -hmm. um, so the mayor had this big ambition that he's going to end homelessness by 2015. Mm -hmm. Is this plan going to help him do the job? No. Um, Why? It actually has potential to create even more homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, there's increasing rent evictions in the downtown east side. And also, one thing that we did get out of this local area plan is a definition of social housing that... Um, is basically on par with market rental. So it, it's basically erased social housing as, as an idea in this very city, in this, as a very idea in this city. So um, we've got a, a definition of social housing that'll keep it out of reach for the people that need it the most. So our viewers on screen, they can see this graph that we've got, and, and this is from the city of Vancouver, and that dark blue uh, part of the table there, that's the social housing, mm -hmm. and what Herb's saying, it's it's going to be too expensive for low-income people to afford, basically. About 980 for a bachelor is social housing in this city mm -hmm. now. And there's a few crumbs there for people on welfare, but is it going to be enough, Tamara? And can you tell us about the yellow part of that graph, the, the, hotel, the residential hotels? Sure. What's going to happen with the hotels? Well, the answer is it's not going to be enough. The way that they define social housing, only 20% of social housing is going to be available to people on welfare and basic pension. And so what that means is that unaffordable housing in the downtown east side is going to outnumber affordable housing 10 to 1. So low-income people are going to be completely overwhelmed by higher-income residents mm -hmm. in the downtown east side, and the neighborhood will be gentrified. Mm -hmm. um, the SROs, that was one of the big losses, the single-room occupancy hotels. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the city is doing away with 
SROs. So right now there's about 5,000 people who are living in SROs and for many of them SROs are the last stop between homelessness. With the number of social housing units that the government, that the city has pledged to create in the 30 years, there's no way that the people living in SROs are going to be able to live in social housing in the downtown east side. So what's happening with the actual SROs? What we're seeing right now, and we're expecting this to continue through the lap, is that uh, SRO owners are renovating hotel rooms and they're finding reasons to get rid of the low-income tenants. And then they're marketing these renovated hotel rooms to students and artists and people who are able to pay more, and they're renting them to them. Wow. So her. Um What's the pulse of the community? Like, how are people, how did people make out at the city hall when they went to the hearing? There was about 150 speakers, if not more, mm -hmm. over multiple days. Like, what mm -hmm. was the vibe up there? Um, it was overwhelmingly supportive of the Low Income Caucus's position, um, especially coming from the Japanese Canadian community who are very interested in what's happening in Oppenheimer Park because um, that used to be called Japantown until World War II. And then, um, most of those, all those residents got shipped up to the P&E, to the internment camps. And the entire neighborhood got liquidated, but um, basically uh, they were interested in what's going on in the revitalization of the Oppenheimer district. And uh, I can't remember what years, but Japanese Canadian community has received several apologies from all levels of government. I can't remember when the city apologized, but in in their apology, a couple, the city, a month ago, a couple yeah. months ago, a couple months yeah. ago, in, yeah. the, in that apology, sure that you know something like that doesn't happen again, that human rights won't be uh, violated in the name of yeah. whatever, and uh, it's happening again right before our yeah. very eyes. So, yeah. a great many number of Japanese Canadians came and supported us and saying, uh, saying y y you promised this wouldn't happen again and. You're letting it happen. Yeah, and people came from all over the city. Uh -huh. It was the m most passionate, mm -hmm. amazing speeches that people made, mm -hmm. and we still Vision Vancouver mm -hmm. sided with, I think, the developer yeah. agenda for the downtown east side. Mm -hmm. So, what about the people in the downtown east side now? You had a, mm -hmm. a town hall meeting yeah. to reflect on the results. Um, what what happened there, Tamara? What are people saying? Well, people are angry. Um, they're really, really worried. Um, you know, every every week in my office, we hear more stories of displacement, and people know that with the signing of the lap, this is going to continue. There's no mm. protection for people living in um, SROs, and there's not enough social housing that's mm -hmm. you know going to be built. So people are wondering, well, are we going to end up living in New West? And the city, the way it's defined social housing citywide, uh, there's no guarantee outside of the downtown east side that any social housing mm. will be at welfare pension rate. Mm -hmm. So that means that people have no idea where they're going to be displaced to. Well, I'd, I'd wager that it's not going to be in New West, given that they spray chicken shit on the ground. Of, that was uh, Abbotsford. Oh, Abbotsford. <laughs> yeah, bleep, bleep. Uh, <laughs> so they, they don't want us in New West anyway. Um, mm -hmm. no. So Herb, uh, what do you think people are going to do? I know there's been a few meetings in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, people are going to try to get organized and maybe try to stop this plan. It's going to be hard to do that because once the city has a plan in place, it's mm -hmm. going to be hard. But it, what, Well, we're just going to have to keep organizing and keep uh, you know, we've been basically been pushed out of every other neighborhood. Uh, you know, in some cases, people have been pushed out in other neighborhoods, in other provinces. So this is literally the first time and place people have found a community home. As imperfect as it is, no, no community is perfect. But basically, we've been pushed out, out of every other place. This is kind of our last place. Um, Are people so going to fight we're, back? We're going yeah. to fight to stay, to stay here. Yeah. Because um, this whole plan has been, th the, the thrust behind this plan is that the guise of mixed income communities, mixed communities are good. Um, that sounds all fine and dandy, but if you look at it, the mix is only coming one way. The condos are coming in, but there isn't any affordable low income housing. I don't even like to use afford the term affordable housing anymore, but there's no low income housing going anywhere else in the city. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where are we going to go? Yeah. Can I make one plug? Sure. Uh, we have an event coming up on June 11th. It's going to be a forum on rent evictions. So if people want to hear some stories from the downtown east side, learn more about, you know, 
people across the city who are being evicted from their apartments due to renovations and seeing the rents jack up. Uh, we'd invite everyone. It's a community event. Great. What time? It's 7 to 9 okay. at the Carnegie Community Centre, which is at the corner of Maine and Hastings, and it's in the theatre. Well, I'd like to thank you two for your work because you went through that three-year process on the committee representing our community, you and the other low-income people on, in, in the downtown east side. And, you know, I know it was really hard, uh, and I, we really need your leadership to continue. So thank you so much for being here and telling us the outcome, and uh, let's stay in touch. <laughs> Okay, so this is a graph that shows how homelessness is caused by government decisions around welfare and around how many units of social housing they build. And it's a graph that goes from right here from 1980 clear down to 2014 today. And as you can see, the numbers on it are 1,000 here, 2,000 here, 3,000 here. So. In the 80s, you can see there are some, this, I should also say this blue here that looks like a mountain range, is the amount of social housing units that have been built in the city of Vancouver. And the red bars are the amount of homelessness for each of the homeless counts. So the other thing you need to know is that in 1980, Welfare rates were $320 a month, which in today's dollars is 940 So welfare rates today are 610 So there was a lot more purchasing power if you were on welfare in 1980, and you could actually afford to rent a bachelor apartment. So looking here in the 80s, th this is the social housing that was being built. You can see there are some years where it was over 1,000 units a year. And in fact, the average from 1980 to 1990 is 767 units a year in the city of Vancouver, new social housing units. Then we get down to 1993, and this is where the federal government drastically reduced the amount of money they put into social housing. So you can see it's, it kind of drops off. And then coming along here, it spikes up a bit in 1999 with, with provincial money here. And then down to 2001, the province drastically cuts back again. And so you can see there's not much here. And in 2002, the next year, the province actually changed welfare rules to make it really, really hard for vulnerable people to get on welfare. So that's when we had a huge spike. And this was when the first homeless count happened, when everyone started getting worried about homelessness, and then because of those welfare rules and because there was very little housing being built, homelessness really went up in 2005 to almost 2,000. And then by 2007, that was the last welfare increase. So that increase b brought the shelter portion, that's the, the portion that people on welfare have for rent, is 375. That's all they can afford for rent. That was the last increase, so that's what the welfare rate is now. And that's also when the city bought 14 sites for housing and the province agreed to fund them. So between 2007 and now, these 14 sites, which will build about 1,400 units, have made the 200 units a year is about what's being built. But homelessness has gone up. You see 2008, it's 2,600. 2011, it's still 2,600. So we get to 2014, and we have the highest homeless count in Vancouver's history. Why is this? It's because there's hardly any social housing being built. It's because welfare rates are so low that people can't afford to pay rent. And there's another reason that isn't on this graph, and that's because the SRO hotels, mostly in the downtown east side, are being upgraded and the rents in them are being raised and the low-income people, the people on welfare and disability who live in them, are being evicted. And so that's what's contributing quite a few hundred people to this, making this bar here so high. So it's rent evictions in the SROs, low welfare rates, and not enough social housing being built. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
My name is Wendy Peterson. I'm here with Access TV, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. We have with us in the studio today three people who've been directly impacted by the housing crisis and actually by Vision Vancouver's decision to not prevent evictions in the downtown east side. Uh, Steve, Blair, Dean, welcome to the studio. So Blair is going to start with you first. Do you live in the Thornton Hotel? We want to get a little snapshot about what's happening there. Um, can you tell me how many people have been evicted from your hotel recently? Almost everybody in the building um, over a period of two or three months has been thrown out. There are only about four or five people left. I think we had about 20 residents when the hotel was bought. and. As I say, almost everyone's been thrown out. How did they? How did they throw them out? Like, can you give us some examples well, of techniques? every morning uh, we wake up to a construction zone. Eight o'clock in the morning, we start setting up saws, pounding the walls with sledgehammers, sawing through two by fours and whatnot. And there's the sawdust flying around, the noise. That alone drives people out of the building. And there's some legal tricks, they, legal things they did too, oh, right? Or, yeah. or, or illegal paying, or whatever. Paying people to move, uh, paying people to inform on one another. Um, <clears throat> a lot and of people just escape, really, from fair point. They just simply escape the noise and the dust and everything. You got an eviction notice. What, what was... What I was successfully, yeah, I was... Um, they tried to evict me for making the building dirty, which, <laughs> uh, you know, the building's been there for a very long time, and um, I won that, so I won my appeal of the eviction, and I get to continue um, suffering in those conditions. So Dean, you're, you were Blair's neighbor, and you got kicked out of the Thornton Hotel with the crazy circumstances that were going on there. Where did you end up? Well, <laughs> I actually, I welcomed the, uh, the opportunity to leave. Uh, and what I did is I jumped out of the fire into the firing pan. The only place available at that particular time was the Lucky Lodge Hotel on on uh, Powell Street. You weren't so lucky. I'm so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What's the rents that were they higher? You paid the more rent? rent? went up the, uh, there's no fridge, there's no, no hot plate, uh, no heat. Yeah. And uh, the, the tenants uh, were a little different. Okay. It's the part of town as well. Yeah. You get more into the thick of thing, whereas Thornton Park is kind of on the fringe of, mm -hmm. of the downtown east side. You're getting right in the middle of it, and it was overwhelming and uh, it's like traumatizing. Yeah. Do you miss your old neighbors and miss the Thornton? Well, I, I, actually, yes, I do. There was one thing you could count on in your day. And I know that a lot of the, the other residents feel the same way, it's, we still speak with each other, is that you could come home and you, once that door closes behind you, you're in a community within a community. And what's happening there is that now you know you're in a safe place, you're going to run into a, a buddy in the hallway, or if you're uh, meeting up with somebody, just you're just going to knock on his door. It's uh, and these are your friends, and it gets down to the point where, like sometimes at Christmas time, these people they don't have close friends and family in Vancouver, mm -hmm. and at Christmas time you've got uh, basically more than half your units meeting in the hallway. Aww sharing Christmas cheer because these yeah. are your friends. Yeah. So, um, Steve, we're so glad that you're here too to talk about this. Do you, you live in a different hotel. You live in the Chelsea uh, Hotel and I've seen a bit of that sense of community in that hotel too. Is that true? Yes, I've been there <clears throat> coming up two years and and uh, within within those walls of the Chelsea People don't know each other, but it's like, except for when you came knocking on my door that one day, because everyone, I know my friends knock at the door. That's cool. But, uh, yeah, we get out, like Christmas time, we have a turkey dinner and that, and we make sure someone's okay, my neighbor, if he has extra soup packet or something, you know, and you give it to him, you know, help your neighbor, and he helps you. Yeah. It's, even upstairs, you know, it's, it's you, you know, what's happening throughout the day. And the you, I, I understand your place, well, the reason I've been in there is because your place is up for sale. That's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of scary in case 
a certain person, uh, Stephen Lippman, comes and purchases such a place, and well, a city hall can interact or intercede or intervene, I guess, to help us, because uh, if they do, then he'll raise the rent, and I can't afford more than I'm paying way too much already. Yeah, um, Dean and I were door knocking in another hotel <laughs> that, that was just purchased by one of the rent eviction uh, developers, and, and we met a young woman who's paying six twenty five for her hotel room now. What is it, um, 10 by? Yeah, just a 10, 10 by 10, 10 room with no bathroom oh, I, and no I, kitchen. I, I know. So we can't afford, people can't afford that in the downtown east side. So in a nutshell, what are we going to do? What, how are we going to stop this? Let do you have any ideas? what's going on. Yeah. People don't realize the, how bad it actually is. It's Maybe. education. You're, you're, you're right. It is. It's yeah. education. And a lot of people, they drive down the street, they see these buildings, they have no idea what's going on inside. What else for in terms of tactics? They, they, they well, I like to have a bed. What's, but what are we going to do to stop this process well, of rent eviction? Well, roadblock Stephen Lippman or roadblock Vancouver. Yeah. Close it down. Blair, any tactics Well, too? I think just letting people know what's actually going on would mm -hmm. go a long way. People do not realize what's going on. Even the construction workers think they're actually uh, helping the poor people, which they're not at all. They may be upgrading the housing a little bit. They glue a little linoleum on the floor and put some an expensive paint on the wall, but that's about the extent of it. And the sense of community is gone. I mean, the minute they start rent evicting, everybody's screaming at each other in the hallways, the staff are screaming with their victims. Um, it's, it's over. The minute the rent eviction landlord buys the place, it's gone. They, everybody is thrown out or escapes. There's loud arguments in the hallways. There's construction noise all day long. So you've got power saws, uh, sanders, and the smell, the fumes of um, various things are putting the walls and the floors and whatnot. So there's 60 <laughs> hotels in the downtown east side that are at risk of renoviction. That means evictions because of real estate speculation, just so those owners can make more money by turfing these guys out of their rooms and jacking up the rents. We need to stop it. And I'm just so honored that Steve and Blair and Dean took the time out of their day to be here and get start getting the word out about this problem in our community. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being our illustrious leader. Uh, you guys are going to be the leader soon. You, know. you don't realize that. <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, through uh, several friends of friends, mentioned Chain to me and some of the work he was doing. So I was really excited about it because it was one of the things I wanted to get involved in years ago, but I didn't have a clue on how to start it. But Shane did. So mm. I fortunately got brought in to help out with the initiative with launching. And because I've done so much work with artists, I'm spending time helping artists get registered for the initiative and also to help them write their artist statements and artist bios because I've done workshops like that before. So uh, that's my role is to work directly with the artists. Oh, nice. So whereabouts are, whereabouts are you from? I'm originally from Alert Bay. Uh, I lived most of my life in Victoria and I moved here to go to Emily Carr um, so I could pursue my, my own arts um, oh. background. Nice. So what kind of uh, artwork are, are you working on? Uh, these days I'm working still with textiles, to do, doing some carving and jewelry. And while I'm at Emily Carr, I'm trying out all kinds of new uh, adventures in pottery and oil painting, things I've never done before. So you're working with a lot of different mediums. Mm -hmm. So Shane, is that when you, you yourself are an artist? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I do an interesting hybrid of artwork from, uh, obviously I'm from two different cultures, but I've got a very uh, strong Coast Salish background in design and, and artwork, uh, and I mix it with my European roots as well, so I come up with, you know, some contemporary stuff, but it's more traditional stuff as well. Nice. So, when, when what, what gave you the idea to create this new initiative? Well, from my community, uh, you know, I've got very strong, uh, you know, familial roots in the art world, you know, my, my granny is probably, she was a matriarch in what well, really our community, let alone my family, and she was an artist, uh, taught me, you know, she was, a, she was more like a deity in our community because she used to weave baskets and she would take the money from weaving these baskets and raise anywhere from 10 to 15 kids at a time, you know, during the dark times where people's parents would kind of lose their way or die or something like that so she was my biggest influence so looking at it from that perspective art was always this uh, very cohesive uh, medium in that it it not only provided for us and, and nationwide uh, I know it's a strong statement but it really is the greatest source of direct revenue into our communities yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, so as a, as a, you know, as a economic sort of uh, mainstay, it's so important, but also culturally, it's, it's not like a written language, it is our traditional written language. There's sophisticated symbolism, so from a cultural perspective, it's so uh, monumentally important that we protect it f just for those two fronts. So. That was the uh, that was the reason why we started this. Yeah. So, in when you guys are, um, uh, how would you go about signing up for to be involved in? Yeah, it's easy. I mean, definitely, uh, uh, you know, get yourself uh, knowledgeable about the program, um, right. and you just have to go to uh, www. Uh, www. authenticindigenous.com. And we've got a whole slew of information. It's uh, it's it's really easy to register, um, but again, get familiar with the concepts around it because it really is the definition of authenticity we're using is true to fact and therefore worthy of trust, reliance, and belief. So we're not telling somebody what authentic is. If you ask 20 different people, you'll get 20 different answers. What we're giving them is the truth. You okay. know. So say say that I was a, a tourist, right? And I was I, I come to Vancouver, or to come to Canada, and I go to purchase uh, a piece of artwork. Mm. But how would I? How could I tell that it was, you know, you know, real or not? Or if it was, is that what your uh, collective is hoping to help create? Like you to bet. have a, basically a, like a label of you know with your logo stamped on the door of that business and basically they say well they actually sell actual indigenous art there yeah is that, is that what your idea is well there'll be a couple different formats uh you know firstly like say this was a product okay uh, yeah, yeah. you know it'll have two things on it, and this is how it works it'll have the artist's name which is very important uh somewhere on it and it'll have the authentic indigenous stamp um which brings them to the website they can then look up the artist and have all the information they want, see samples of their product so that they can compare and contrast and they know this is, you know, the real thing. Yeah. Um, 
what we'd like to see is we'd like to see the gift shops and galleries carrying as much of this stuff as possible because obviously it has that economic and cultural. Yeah, made in Canada. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, there's different tiers, and, and the way that I describe this is it's, it's uh, the best way to protect our economies and culture within an operational reality. So we do realize that things are made overseas. We do think, you know, realize things are mass produced. But as long as the artist designs are protected and they have control over that and they're getting a royalty or, and we can ensure that they're being fairly paid, those producers of those products can carry a tier three or a tier two brand, um, you know, based on those stipulations. Nice. So, Luann, and you do some of the artwork for it? Mm -hmm. The design I, of the, the logo of well, um, Authentic Indigenous? I, I'm partially an administrator, a coordinator for the project, but I'm also an artist myself. So I actually create Tier 1 and Tier 2 products. But uh, the tag is what I'm helping the artists get onto their Tier 1 and 2 works as well. So um, uh, so if somebody wanted to get uh, to learn more information mm -hmm. about what you, know, what you guys are about mm -hmm. and what would you, what's Well, like Shane said, I, I think uh, definitely checking out the website, but also we have a Facebook page, and I'm in charge of the Facebook page, so I'm on there pretty much every day responding to people's questions, um, filling, just filling it up with lots of information, things that people are concerned about. I can address those usually directly on the Facebook page. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm Gary Oliver, and I, uh, uh, Hopefully, uh, get a chance to meet with you guys again and do maybe do another interview. Mm -hmm. And I want to uh, uh, thank you very much for coming on the program. Thanks so much for having us. Should First Nation cultural images be treated like champagne or feta, geographically branded and only used by the regions who create them? We want to know what you think. Thanks, Gary. Well, Authentic Indigenous is already in three galleries. You can check out works at the Squamish Lillooet Cultural Centre, the MOA, and the Latimer Gallery. Next up, we have a group of fun, unique, creative individuals, a handful of them in studio. Here they are, the Street Beat Crew. <laughs> Hi everyone, we're the hosts of Club Fusi. My name is Pauline. My name is Blessy. And, and we're, we're the Riveras. Riveras. Our show, Club Fusi, is a place where youth can connect with each other and build self-confidence, as Fusi stands for Fun, Unique, Creative Individuals. On our show, we showcase many local talents, such as comedians, dancers, singers, and local bands as well. With that being said, we have a few guests for you today who are involved in Club Fusi. We have Jadine, Rachel, and Samantha. Hi ladies, how are you all today? Good, I'm great. Great. So let's start off with you first, Jadine. What's your role on Club Fusi? I'm one of the co-hosts, and what I do is I connect the host with the audience. What I mean by that is I ask the audience questions, and I also get them to participate in games such as Name That Tune and Celebrity Scramble. Sounds fun. So how's your experience on the show so far? I'm having lots of fun and I'm really enjoying it because I get to meet a lot of people in the audience. Great. So let's go ahead and see Jadine in action. Hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Jadine. And we're Club Fusi. You've been watching Club Fusi. And I'm Jeremy. I'm Rachel. I'm Jadine. I'm Isabel. You've been watching Club Fusi. Fun. Unique. Creative. Individuals. And, and we're Club Fusi. All right, so next up we have Rachel. Hi, Rachel. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. That's great. So um, not only are you a co-host on Club Fusi, but I hear that you're also the winner of Summer Night Idol 2013. Am I right? Yes, you are right. That's great. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, how was it being on the SNI show? It was fun because when we're backstage, you get to talk and listen to the other people performing and singing. 
Wow. Wow, great. So what was your winning song at SNI? I Surrender by Celine Dion. Oh, wow, I love that song. Um, we actually have a clip of you singing I Surrender on the show. So here it is. To you, I know you can feel it too. We make it through a thousand dreams. I still believe I'll make you give them all to me. I hold you in my arms and never let go. I surrender. <laughs> Last but not least, we have the newest member of our FUSI team, Samantha. Hi. Hi. Um, how are you today? I'm good. Great. Yourself? Um, yeah, I'm very excited. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having um, me. Yeah. So, <laughs> as you know, our show ha um, is aware of many social issues going on today with youth, one of them being bullying. Mm -hmm. So, what are your thoughts on bullying? Well, it's really sad to know that bullying targets most of the youth, especially kids that are like 10, 12, 13, mm -hmm. and it's pushing them towards suicide, depression. It's really sad. Um, it's not that good. I really don't like how mm -hmm. lots of people are being targeted, and people shouldn't have to go through something like that. Yeah, I agree. So have you had experience with bullying before? How was that? How, how did you cope with it? Actually, um, I did have experience. Uh, it was pretty recent, actually, but I got through it with a lot of support from my friends and family. Mm -hmm and it was good to have people there right. for me. That's always great. So with that being said, um, what advice would you give to those who are being bullied right now? Well, so I would tell the victims of bullying basically to keep your head up, you know, uh, don't let what other people say about you define who you are. Always believe in what you think of yourself and, you know, always stay true to who you are. Mm -hmm. That is a beautiful message. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. And uh, we'd like to thank all of you ladies for being on the show today. Um, that's all we have. For today, don't, uh, don't forget to watch our show, Club Boosie, which is coming soon. You don't want to miss it. Again, we're the Riveras, and you are watching Access TV featuring Club Boosie. See you soon. Bye. 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 All right, I look forward to hearing what is next from the Street Beat crew. You can check out their website. They're on stages around the Lower Mainland performing. Well, the Urban Grange is largely a thing of the rural past. It was a place where farmers met to exchange ideas and find solutions to farming and the challenges of growing food crops. Well, food sovereignty is a big topic lately, and food advocate Judy Kenzie is next up, and she's launched the Urban Grange as a resource for people in the city who want to grow their own food. Let's hear from Judy. There's a bee in my bonnet, hello, hello, a bee in my bonnet, hello. So when you're going to transplant your seedlings, uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to put some rocks into the bottom of your pot to help increase the drainage. And then you want to add some soil. Leave some space so that you have some room to put your plants so that you don't have to mess with the roots too much. Very, very carefully. Take your plants out, position them where you want them. Now this is a pepper plant, and then I've got a couple different kinds of greens here, some mustards, and we're going to put a little bit of fertilizer in. and give him a nice drink. Soil can be quite drying to your hands, so one of the tricks that I like to use is I put on hand cream before I put on my gloves. Thank you, Judy. 
Well, the Urban Grange is in the process of establishing its own local urban farm here in Vancouver's east side. You can go to theurbangrange.ca for more information. In November 2013, brothers Gordon, Larry, and Howard Grant from the Musqueam Territory made their first visit to the ancestral village of their father in Guangdong Province, China. They were accompanied by members of their family, as well as documentary filmmakers Sarah Ling and Alejandro Yoshizawa. This documentary trailer we're about to show you is called All Our Father's Relations. And we are pleased to present this trailer and it's followed by some comments from Larry Grant as he remembers that historic journey he made with his brothers. Your thoughts go back the last few weeks to say, okay, I'm going to my father's homeland and then um, when it grew nearer and nearer, you didn't know what your emotions were telling you. Because we grew up in similar circumstances in Musqueam, the size of those houses I thought were, would have been enormous for us as Musqueam children. Uh, uh, and to see them still standing there, built by our grandfather, and, and uh, seeing his picture there was quite different from looking at the pictures at Kosuk Place in Burnaby. Uh, there they were on the wall of the house that he built. The, re the reciprocation that uh, we received and of, of that welcoming and that warm embrace of family. That's who our people were, were in Musqueam, that, that our old people, you know, they were very open-armed and uh, welcoming of, of newfound friends and what they would call relatives. one of the most emotional times in my life. I did not have this emotion when our dad passed away. I'd never had this emotion when our mother passed away. But when we walked into that village through that gateway and our relatives were there and, uh, and our, our uncle left alive in China uh, just sort of blew me away. Uh, in my mind, he was the spitting image of Uncle Tommy. It was like Uncle Tommy rose out of the grave to greet us. And that was just, uh, I could have just sat down and cried. Uh, and, uh, uh, I've never had that emotion before. Uh, and just to see the relatives that were left behind and that were part of our lives. And thank you to everyone that took the time to be here this evening to honor us, to, to stand us up, as they say in Hunt Kaminam language. We've been stood up this, this evening uh, in, in public and honored in public. And that's a real, really big honor in our community to be, to be stood up. Not my girlfriend, but <laughs> but to, to stand you up and lift you up and hold you up in front of your community and your relationships. Uh, so I want to say thank you. I truly, truly appreciate what's happened this evening. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm probably as uh, modest as my younger brother, but. Uh, it is something that uh, I have never had any expectations of anything, and I truly, truly appreciate it. So I, I say, if I was the empress, yeah, yeah, see you tall, see you tall, for not, see.
Finish Gwalaun, couldn't see the Atala Haitaka. Gotcha. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the film. I guess Larry Grant's comments were recorded at the Chinese Canadian Historical Society of British Columbia's annual general meeting dinner. Thus, the background sound. For more information on the film, you can go to allourfathersrelations.com. So no matter how much information you have at your fingertips, it doesn't make you wise. And we are going to see that in this next short featurette documentary called Lessons Learned, directed by Eric Willemot, Chris McLean, and Emma Rudenreis for Kaleidoscope's film program, part of Agora Employment Services of BC. Here they are taking a look at the lives and experiences of some of our elders living in Vancouver and Burnaby. In a world of rapid advancement such as our own, it gets harder and harder for us, particularly younger citizens, to realize just how ever-changing our modern world has become. Computers, cell phones, vacations to outer space, these quantum leaps of human achievement have all become quite commonplace in our daily lives. So, how did we get here? Well, to gain some perspective, the best approach is to talk with those who lived in a time when such advancements were just starting to gain ground, or simply, didn't exist at all. It was after the war, and there was a lot of immigrant families, European and Italian families. So I had a lot of, you know, Italian friends. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I tasted spaghetti. During the war, it was quite hectic because I was 13 years old when the war started. And one afternoon, there was a, a German plane that came across the channel and as I was right in the line of fire I went outside and I could see the German plane see the swastika and even the pilot it was so low it was flying right across when I was five I rode my horse to the village school and let's remember the war had just finished right just simply speaking I was the daughter of a family whose side had won the war and most of the pupils were children of families that had tried to support Hitler. So I had no friends at school. 1929, my father decided to give up his little homestead and move to a ranch. So he moved 40 miles up the line on the new, brand new railroad line, and he bought a ranch. It must have been a very hard life growing up on a ranch. No, it was not. We were a large family, and it was during the Depression. And I was in the middle of the family, so I was actually a cowgirl. My father passed away, my mother was ill, so I had to quit school and go to work. We were very poor to begin with, so there wasn't much money to spend. My father had a garden, and uh, as a teenager, I did make a lot of my own clothes. So I think today it's easier for the kids, they just take the charge card and go charge their clothes. Well, the family ties were very strong, as you know, during the Depression. They had no money, but the families were all the same. And they all stuck together, and they all uh, uh, managed to come through the Depression without any ill effects. And of course, everything was, was rationed, and you had, you know, things, a uh, ration book. I still have one today that my aunt gave me. I still have a ration book. You were expected to grow up and, and in the community and the things that, that were going on in those days. You were taught to be a housewife, 
you were expected to be married and take care of a home. And it, it, there wasn't so much emphasis on education. It was more going out to work when you were 18 or 17 or 18 and finished school. I, I've always believed in being honest and trying to do the best that I could and I think I've done that all through my life. It wasn't a very materialistic um, s um, set of rules. You know, you didn't have to be rich to be recognized. You know, the clothes you wore weren't that important. In fact, I hardly wore any clothes at all until I had to go to school. So I think kindness was a great thing. It seems like such a distant notion nowadays, growing up during a war that people felt the effects of worldwide. But now that we've gained some perspective on how people lived in the pre-modern world, I'm interested to hear their opinion on the world they live in now. We've come a long way, and I think it's wonderful. Uh, and there's no end in sight, as you know. They're still go planning on sending more satellites out and everything like that. In some ways it's a lot easier, in other ways it's it's not. Um, you know, I don't agree with the way the, 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 the young people grow up today. Um, I don't think there's enough discipline in the way that, that I, I see people on the bus and I see the children are, have more control over the parents than the parents have over the children, which I think is wrong. Well, I don't feel there's um, a lot of interaction between parents and children because kids today are really into their computers. I think what we need right now is more continuity in families and more unity and more togetherness. Well, the biggest change, Paul, is that the respect for your elders has gone by the wayside. You know, years ago, people would call it Mr. So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so, and they would never talk back to their elders or anything. Well, now, just go out in the mall, and you'll just hear all the language and the attitude, the body language and everything. It's just terrible. I feel that you know, humans have invented things as we've gone along through time. And often it's the, uh, the person using that invention that will make it a good thing or a not good thing. I mourn the loss of knowledge. I feel that technology is um, filling our minds with information and information is not knowledge. On the other hand, I'm absolutely astounded at the power of social media. I applaud it. Um, because of the results, information <laughs> carried that way to uh, awaken people to a reality that is further than that little isolated bubble of fast-moving messages, right? That I applaud. I really do, and I think it's great. And I wouldn't know what to do without a computer or email. My life right now is great. I spent my life doing ballroom dancing, which I loved. My life has been good, and I have nothing to complain about. I've, I'm enjoying my life right now. Lastly, I'm interested if there's any parting words of wisdom they'd like to share with the youth of the day to make their lives just a little bit better. There's something for people to do all the time. That that's no way for them to sit at home and say, I haven't anything to do and I'm so lonely. If they are, it's their own fault have a good education and work and and you know do the best you can be honest be truthful and be true to yourself and uh, you just don't expect things to come easily you have you have to work for things put out your love and gratitude for being alive because it'll come back but you must stop Stand still, breathe deep, appreciate. Just be, you know, have a good life and uh, be happy.
how far we've come in such a short time. Well, Lessons Learned can be viewed again on YouTube and other films by the Kaleidoscope Project. Well, next up is part two of the Urban Grange, in which Ethan plants a tomato properly. He's an eight-year-old, and he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. So Ethan, you're going to plant the tomato today. And remember, when you're planting a tomato, see this? It's got quite a long stem on it, right? So if you plant it so that the stem is covered up to about here, what will happen is roots will come out. There's a bee in my bonnet, hello, hello, a bee in my bonnet, hello. Now, very carefully, take the tomato. How you going to tip this, okay? Now you got to be careful because you can see there's roots at the bottom, right? So there you go. Now place it in there. Nice. Next, I want you to add some soil. Okay. Here, I'll help you. Okay. We're going to add lots. We're going to add it right to the top of the pot. Okay. Okay. Don't worry about the mess. There. See how much of the, the stem we've covered up? Nicely done. And then we add a bit of fertilizer. And then here, here we go. And we water it lots. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks to Ethan for taking the plunge and giving that tomato life. I'm sure it's doing well. Well, we're gonna nurture our community and you're gonna nurture your garden and we'll be back with more stories and truths from the downtown east side and beyond right here on Access Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. The music of Sean Gunn. Canada, I don't know. <laughs>